Could I introduce myself? All right, this is Mauve. Uh, Mauve is the last speaker of today. Uh, thank you everybody for joining in for the DAT conference. Um, Mauve will be talking to us about the DAT SDK and giving uh, and let us know how we use that thing. Um, thank you everybody for joining in and I'm having and giving it over to Mauve. Hi, um, so thank you all for uh, staying up this late or getting up this early, depending on where you are. Um, so we've been talking about hyperdrive and hypercore and Rust and JavaScript and types and web browsers and all of this cool stuff. So at the end of the conference, we're going to look at how you can start making stuff with it. So um, I just pasted a link in the chat. It's uh, github.com slash ranger move slash dat dash workshop. So um, you don't really need uh, me talking to follow this, hopefully. Um, I just add a little bit of extra spice to the mix. So I encourage people, or maybe, um, how do I do a poll with this thing? Um, here, yeah. Uh, yes, no, wait, how do I ask a question? <laughs> oh my God, already, I should have practiced. Um, yeah, the chat is totally frozen for me. Um, all right, start a poll. Uh, okay, um, I can't say anything, but how many of you, <laughs> no, don't answer. Um, okay, can, can one of the moderators make a poll because I'm too, <laughs> too slow? Uh, basically, it'd be nice to get a show of hands of how many people are going to try to follow along with the, um, presentation. Custom poll following along. Mm. Delta F1 says they had to clone over HTTPS. So uh, I'm uh, pretty sure you need SSH set up with GitHub for it to let you clone off of SSH. It's actually kind of sketchy. Um, but basically, uh, you know, whatever works for you. So I guess, uh, Martin, when you can uh, publish them results. I don't know how to view them. Oh, there we go. OK, cool. So there's a decent amount of people following along. So. Um, Martin, something I should figure out how to do. Um, every time when I start a poll, your screen will go away. OK, cool. Um, I'll just use the chat then for now. So um, is there anyone in the chat that hasn't cloned and set up the repo yet? So we're over at the setup stage of the um, workshop. So what you'll need to do is make sure you have Git installed. And there is a link for downloads on your. Um, you won't need to really use Git outside of downloading the workshop. Uh, next, you'll want to have Node.js installed. Um, and ideally, have at least a little bit of experience with JavaScript or feel comfortable reading it. And then finally, you'll need a cutting edge code editor, like Visual Studio Code, to make use of all of the TypeScript definition files that I don't have. <laughs> um, so I'm using, so in the chat, there's a question, what node version would you recommend? I'm using nodes 12, I think, 12.16. Uh, I think node 14, I'm not sure if it works yet. Uh, same with 13. Um, I'm pretty sure 11 works. 
and you should probably have something higher than node six because that's been dead for a while. Um, so uh, basically what we're going to be doing today is looking over the dat SDK. So let me take a moment and just kind of explain what this project is. So um, essentially what we've had in the DAT community is a series of tools building on some similar structures. So most notably, we had the DAT command line interface. And what that did was it used a special storage mechanism to kind of uh, store files on disk which would actually be inside these DAT archives. And so you can run the CLI to either download an archive to the disk or take the data on a disk and turn it into an archive that other people could download. And so under the hood, this was using Hyperdrive, um, the special storage mechanism and Discovery Swarm. So it was kind of gluing it together in its own way. Now, another popular application was Beaker. And so Beaker, it was also using Hyperdrive and Discovery Swarm, but it was using it in kind of its own way. And as well, we had other applications in the ecosystem, notably stuff built on the multi-feed or Kappa ecosystem. And so they took Hypercore, not Hyperdrive, and Discovery Swarm, and then kind of like added a bunch of stuff on top of the wire protocol. And so they had something that was like, completely different from everyone else. So I was kind of looking around through the various projects in the ecosystem. And it was honestly kind of hard to figure out how to actually start with that and like, what even is that? And how do I build stuff? And it got even harder to figure out. Um, oh, so there's a comment in uh, the um in the chat saying that they got permission denied for cloning what you'll want to do is when you hit the uh clone option click the use https button and use that url instead so uh the url should be this i'll post that in the chat so you'll want to do git clone and then all that Okay. Uh, okay, cool. So what I wanted to do was kind of simplify, um, kind of look at what all of the other projects were doing and kind of make a reusable piece that other people could um, use for building their own peer to peer applications. So what I kind of saw was that people were using the same. Oh, yes. And it, in the ch chat, there is also a comment saying that um, you can also download the zip directly. We're not using Git for anything fancy, so that's totally valid. Um, just clone it and resume. Um, so every project was kind of taking this storage layer, this networking layer, and gluing it together with the replication. Or is the way they were doing that was platform dependent. So if someone wanted to use their same code Oh, and my video's gone. Oh my gosh. Is it the video, my video was or my... fine. It might be with Nina. Okay. Man, technical difficulties. You know, let's just say this is an extension of um live coding demo. So it makes sense that everything is broken. Totally fine. It's actually scripted. My camera was supposed to go down. Um yeah, thank you to the AV team for making that happen. Um, anyways, I'm kidding. Um, so people would make these apps and they wouldn't work in other JavaScript environments. So one of my goals was to get all of this DAT stuff, not only make it easy to build on top of, but also make it easy to get that same code or pretty much the same code into the browser. So that's kind of what create, what spawns DAT SDK. And, um, what it does for a user is it gives you the primitives for working with the peer-to-peer -peer data structures. It abstracts away some of the networking and the storage while giving you some control over how that works. And I mean, actually a lot of control if you 
look into the config options, which are poorly documented, cough, cough. Um, uh, my fault. And it kind of gives you just like an out of the box experience that pretty much works. So we've got a few uh, tools in our toolbox. We've got Hyperdrive, Hypercore, and extension messages or Swarm, the Swarm. So there's some more like nuance under the hood, but that's kind of the general things and that's what we'll be covering today. So um, the first tool we're gonna look at is Hyperdrive and it's kind of the bread and butter of the DAT ecosystem and it's the file system abstraction. So a Hyperdrive is a magic folder. You can create it. It has a unique URL. You can shove files into it. And then if someone else takes that URL, they can load files from it. And then there's some peer-to-peer -peer magic sauce under the hood, which automatically connects the hyperdrive initialized on one computer to the hyperdrive initialized on another computer. And what's cool is that even if the original person that created the hyperdrive is offline, if there's another person here, uh, they can just download the data from anyone else that has a copy on the network. So it's very resilient, very useful, and the interface is pretty much just a file system. And what's cool is it's uh, the same as the Node.js file system with some small exceptions for file descriptors. Um, any questions so far? So there's a question in the chat, who has permission to add files? So at the moment with Hyperdrive, uh, only the person that created the hyperdrive is able to add files to it and specifically that person's computer that created it. So you can't take a hyperdrive and move it to another computer and uh, modify it from both computers due to some distributed system shenanigans. There's some higher level things on top of hyperdrive that um, kind of work. So there's Kappa Drive, which was presented earlier from the Cobox team. And um, there's, you could probably figure out your own thing if you, I don't know, struggle a bunch. We might have multi-writer built into Hyperdrive in the future, but so far uh, it's one device per machine. There's kind of like a nuance to that in that uh, while you can't have a person, someone else come in and write to your archive or sorry, to your Hyperdrive, what you can do is if someone creates their own hyperdrive, you can take it and put it underneath yours as a folder. And so they can modify anything they want in that folder because it's their hyperdrive. Whereas you, you can control all the other folders, but you can't touch the one that is their hyperdrive. So that's kind of the multi-writer state at the moment. Um, yeah, so that was probably a lot, but let's just go and look at what this actually looks like. So in our folder, we have a few subfolders for the various things we're going to be looking at. And we're going to start by looking at the Hyperdrive folder. So we've got a few examples here for how to use Hyperdrive, and they're numbered. So what we're going to do is check out the first example. Um, so um, you'll want to use whatever code editor you like. If you use Visual Studio, you can probably double click it. Um, if you use Vim, you know, you don't need my help, you know more than me. Um, I use Nano because I'm a little baby and I have a little baby config that makes it look like a regular text editor so I don't, don't have to memorize keyboard shortcuts. Okay, so what we're gonna do is just kind of walk through this line by line. Um, is anyone having trouble viewing this? And also, can I make it a little bit bigger? Cool, so, oh, people typing. All right, cool, looks like it's fine. Um, so at the top of the file, we kind of talk about what it does Ah, yeah, okay, excellent question in the chat. Can you give context of where this JS would run? You need a web server? So in our case, we're gonna be testing the Node.js version of Hyperdrive for now. And then at the end, we're gonna see how it works in Electron as well. So uh, 
that's why in the setup we had instructions for installing Node.js. So what we'll do is all of the files in these folders, other than the Electron thing, which I'll show you how to do that later, we're just going to use uh, the Node's command line utility to run it. So uh, if you want to check if you have Node set up, uh, type Node dash dash version. Um, also, for anyone that missed it, the setup section is over here. I pasted it in the chat again. Cool. Uh, another question in the chat. Um, all right, well, that's typing. Um, so, Cool. Yeah. So Redfish says, okay, so it's just an application running on your OS, like any other that just happens to be written in JavaScript. Yes. So Node.js is kind of like just the JavaScript part of a browser, but then instead of all, all the other browser stuff, they added their own stuff. Um, so if you want to do HTTP requests, there's a Node.js way to do it, and then there's browser code. So that SDK lets you take the same code pretty much and make it run in a regular web browser in addition to Node.js. We'll get to how that works in a second, but we'll just start with Node.js for now because there's a lot more, a lot fewer moving parts. So um, I'm just going to assume people are semi-comfortable with Node.js and JavaScript and say that this is how we're going to load the SDK. So when you install a Node module, you use NPM. And this module is called dat SDK, and it exports um, the SDK factory constructor function singleton, whatever. The thing that initializes the SDK, which happens to be in async function. So uh, a lot of cool JavaScript stuff is asynchronous, which is kind of one of its uh, strengths. But also, it's asynchronous, so it, that's one of its weaknesses. So luckily, these days, kids these days have async await, which makes everything just so much easier. Um, so we're going to use async functions. And all of the examples are going to have this main function wrapping everything. And then at the end of the file, we're just invoking main to have it start executing our code. Uh, it doesn't have to be called main. Um, it can be whatever the heck he wants. You can use other promises. So what I like to do is wrap everything in a try catch so that at the end of the try catch, I could have a block that says finally. And that's because you don't want to have random memory leaks. So whenever you initialize the SDK, you should make sure to close the SDK because otherwise your process will just keep hanging and you won't know why it's exiting, and then you'll force quit it in a panic, and that'll actually mess up um, some of the reliability of the peer-to-peer -peer discovery. It won't mess it up, it just could s slow things down. So it's always good to have a try-catch and release any resources that you load. Um, for the SDK, uh, closing it closes any hyperdrives or hypercores or whatever else that you loaded. So that makes it a little bit easier to manage. So to initialize the SDK, you await the SDK constructor and pass in a set of configuration options. So there's a few things you can tweak here. For instance, where you want the data to be stored. So if you have multiple applications using the SDK, you might want them to store data in different folders. And from there, you can give it a name. In our case, since we're running examples and we don't really care about saving this, uh, we're going to be passing in this persist flag and setting it to salt. False. Salt. Oh my gosh. I'm very tired. So what this tells the SDK is to just store everything in memory. And once we close it, just delete all of that memory and let it go poof back into the ether. Um, so what this returns to us is an object with a bunch of the APIs provided by the SDK. We're using some shorthand JavaScript syntax to declare variables, which are kind of pulling variables out of this returned object. So we're just going to use the hyperdrive API and the close API for garbage collection. Um, 
So now we're going to look at how to create a hyperdrive. Um, so the way hyperdrives work is every hyperdrive has a unique key. And usually when you create a hyperdrive, you generate a unique key and then you need to use that key to reference that hyperdrive again. Some of the underlying features of um, the Hypercore protocol ecosystem, namely this thing called Core Store, let you generate keys from names using this feature called namespaces. So I've kind of abstracted that away in the SDK saying you can have named hyperdrives. So instead of passing a hyper URL or, um, or like the raw key used for the hyperdrive, you can just specify a name and that name is something that'll be unique to your instance of the SDK. So every time you in every single instance of the application, they'll create their own hyperdrive key for that name. But then in the application, you don't need to save that key for later. You can just always use the name so that um, it simplifies some things. So whenever you create a hyperdrive, um, what you'll usually want to do is to invoke the ready function. What this does is it sets up some internals. Um, it's very nuanced. Generally, you want to do this if you're going to be accessing any properties like the peers or the version of the hyperdrive or the key or discovery key, um, because those only get generated after the or right before the ready events. So this is a way to just make sure your drive is in a state that it's um, ready to play ball. So in Beaker, you might have seen um, these hyper colon slash slash URLs. They're very fancy. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if the microphone is picking up the sirens. Uh, I swear I didn't do it. Um, so generating that key, or sorry, that URL, you take the key in the hyperdrive and then you put it into a string of hexadecimal bytes. Um, there might be more nuance, but that's generally how it works. Uh, so I have a bunch of console.log statements everywhere so that you can see where the code is in the execution. Um, if you're super fancy, you might want to use Node.js's inspect uh, flag to have like Chrome dev tools. Um, I'm in a command line. We're not going to do that. So now that I have a hyperdrive, what I can do is write and read data from it. So you do that by using the write file and read file APIs. Wow. So just like in the file system API, you can specify a path for which you want to write the um, file to, and then some data. So that data can be a string, or it can be a buffer. That's pretty much it. Um, if you want more than that, then you know probably read more code. Uh, and then after you've got a file, you can also read from it. So actually, let me try to make my terminal just a little bit bigger. Is that still legible? OK, cool. Perfect. Oh, excellent. So after you've written a file, you can use the read file API to get the file back out. So one thing, though, the default for reading a file is reading it back as a buffer. So if you have a text file, it's not going to be super useful. So that's why read file has a second parameter called uh, the encoding. And so you can either omit it for it to be a buffer or specify UTF-8 for uh, the standard string encoding. There's more options that you can put here. Um, probably shouldn't touch them anytime soon. Uh, so next. One thing I want to demo here is that if you try to read a file that doesn't exist, exist. in our case, we have example.txt, and we're trying to read nothing.txt, it'll actually throw an error. So sometimes you want to have try-catch blocks when you're not sure if a file will exist and you want to do something if it doesn't. Um, in addition to being able to write files, you can create directories, so folders inside the um, hyperdrive. Uh, and that's the same as the Node.js API. Um, similarly, if you want to write a file into a folder, you can just specify the folder in the path. So here we have slash post slash one. 
slash post slash two. And we can do that because slash posts is created. If you try to write to a if you try to write a file to a directory that hasn't been created yet, um, there will be an error. And that's, I think, to be in line with, um, you know, Unixy file systems and basically how real file systems work. Um, as well, if you want to see what files are in a folder, you can use the read dir command with the path to the folder to get back um, a JavaScript array of strings. Uh, finally, if you want to know whether a certain path is a file or a folder or how big it is, there's the stat command, and that'll give you back some information about um, the statistics. Uh, the stat command has an is directory and is file method that I didn't showcase, but uh, this is the same as the Node.js API, so you might want to uh, look at those docs if you want to see what else you can do. Finally, after you're done with the drive, it's good to close it so that it can be garbage collected and any connections that it has can be closed so that you're not wasting system resources. And okay, so now that we've put all of that together, what we're going to do is run the script file. So I'm going to use node and then the path to the file, hit run, and wow, it worked. So let's see what the output was. So here we have the URL that was generated for the drive, pretty standard. Here we see that we wrote to the drive. Here we see that um, reading from the drive without an encoding gave us a buffer with just the raw bytes. Uh, and then when we did specify the encoding, we got back a string. When we tried to read a file that didn't exist, we got an error saying no such file or directory. Um, we were able to create a post folder, and inside the post folder, we added the, the posts 2.md and 1.md. I don't know what the sort order is. Um, if you care about the alphabetical order, you should probably do a sort after you read. Finally, the stat object has uh, a bunch of properties, which I'm not going to get into. Maybe size is something you care about. Um, the rest are, you know, super advanced. Cool. Any questions so far about creating and reading or initializing the SDK? Great. So now that we have uh, creating hyperdrives out of the way and we kind of know how to use them, let's check out how to actually um, use the peer-to-peer -peer aspect. Oh, there's more stuff in the chat, so I'm going to wait a second. Awesome. People like code comments. Who would have thought? Um, oh, and it seems to be working in Node 14. Great. I didn't know that. Maybe I can update now. Um, maybe. You never know with native dependencies. Um, so we're going to go on to the second example. Ah, uh, yeah. Where are the type definitions? I don't have type definitions in uh, structured format, but that SDK has, uh, here, I'm just going to bring up the link. That SDK has a readme, which documents everything that it exposes. And so that readme is going to be up to date and has a few examples on how to use the um, SDK as well. If you're ever trying to like work on stuff and Move isn't around to tell you how it works and it's not in the examples, um, check out the readme. I love readmes. You can also look at the readmes for the actual hyperdrive, hypercore uh, repos. Um, we're not going to get into that for now. So let's check out how we're going to load the drive. So same as before, we're going to require the SDK. Uh, <laughs> and what we're going to do this time is totally crazy. Um, we're going to initialize two versions of the SDK. Uh, maybe more conservative, you know, self-respecting people would create two files and run two processes. Um, I'm just going to simulate there being two processes by initializing 
two versions of the SDK. So they all have their own storage and they both have their own networking. So they're going to be finding each other the same way two processes on your OS would, or the way two computers over your net, the local network would, or the way two computers over the internet would. So you can initialize as many versions of the SDK as you want, and they're all going to be isolated. And what we're doing here might be a little tricky. We're using that same JavaScript shorthand for pulling out variables. But what we're saying is we're going to take the variable hyperdrive, pull it out of the SDK, and we're going to call it hyperdrive1. And similar close is going to be close1. And then for the other SDK, it's going to be um, hyperdrive2 and close to. There's a question in the chat. Do you mean two instances of the SDK or two versions of the SDK? So this is going to be two instances of the same version of the SDK because they're both being loaded in the same script file. Though um, different versions of the SDK should be pretty compatible unless there's like a huge breaking change. Um, how will you know if there's a big breaking change? Well, probably the major version will update, that's for sure. Um, but sometimes there might be a major version update that's just the um, API that's different, but the wire protocol will be different. I don't know, check the releases page. Um, so now we have two versions of the SDK. I'm gonna kind of go a little bit faster here. Um, we initialize our original hyperdrive using a name. We're gonna write a file into it. Notice I didn't use the await original.ready um, method because whenever you invoke asynchronous methods on the hyperdrive as your first thing, you don't have to worry about um, waiting for ready to happen. Um, you, you might want to still do the ready thing just so that you don't run into problems, but um, if you're ready to YOLO it, just use a method first. So next we're going to fetch the key out. And what we're going to do is take this hyperdrive2, which is from the second instance of the SDK, and we're going to pass a key into the constructor instead of passing in a name. So that key is going to tell it to try to load that particular archive off of the network. So this time we're definitely going to want to invoke ready, because what we're going to do next is check whether the key is has been set properly and whether the archive is writable. So one thing I didn't get into yet is I'm going to say archive and drive. They're the same thing. We're transitioning from archive to drive. Um, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to me. But in your mind, just, just imagine drive and hyperdrive and forget I ever said archive. <laughs> so every archive has a property that tells Every drive has a property that tells you whether you can actually modify it or not. Um, in case you have an application where you have a library and it's getting a mix of archives that are writable and read-only. Um, generally, you probably won't need this. So one kind of nuance to note here is that even though we've set up the archive, we're actually not going to be able to read a file from it. And that's because uh, if you try to read from the archive when there's no data available, um, sorry, when you haven't done any synchronization, it's only going to see an empty directory. So what we're going to do is add a little bit of code to make it more robust. So what we're going to do is check the peers property of the hyperdrive, and that's an array of information about all of the people you're currently connected to or all the other peers in the peer-to-peer -peer network. So if we already have some people connected, then we're probably fine. We can, uh, we're already replicating with them, so we can load the data. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the peer open events. So the hyperdrive object has a bunch of useful events on it, namely peer open gets submitted when you've established a connection to a peer and done the handshake. So you've exchanged some information about what the other side has. Um, and the peer removed or remove event, you'll want to check the docs, which tells you that a peer has disconnected from you. So we're using a utility here called once, which comes packaged with the uh, Node.js events module. Basically what it does is it takes something that emits events and an event 
and it returns a promise which contains the results of that event. So, uh, and that'll be an array of arguments that would have been passed to the Node.js callback for the event. So what we're gonna do is take out the peer that we just connected to, and we're gonna log the peer's remote public key. So every, um, every peer in the network has a unique key which gets generated, it either gets persisted to disk uh, with the, if you're using the SDK in a non-persisted mode, or it gets generated on the fly every time you initialize. So this key is used for the encryption. Oh, uh, load someone's drive 88, once is not a function. Yeah, so Eric has a problem saying once is not a function. I think you need, uh, try to get like node 12 installed. I usually use NVM for managing versions of Node. Um, your operating system might require something else. And yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so this remote public key can uniquely identify a peer. So if your application is trying to have persistent identities or knowing that there's like a deny list of folks you really never want to connect to, or maybe you have an allow list of the only folks you want to connect to, you can kind of listen on the peer open event and break any connections you don't like. Um, you probably won't use it, but it's nice to know. So now that we've waited for the peer open event, we know that we have someone we're replicating with and it's saved to read the file. And so this time it actually is going to work. Um, as well, this is to test that you can't write to the file because you just have a copy. Ah, oh, yeah, there's a note in the chat saying once was added in node 10.16, so you'll probably probably want a version higher than that. Um, I'd recommend 12 or 14. Um, yeah, so let's run this and see how it works. So again, we're going to use the node binary. Um, also, for people using the command line that don't use it too much, I like to use tab completion. So I do node and then dot slash and then type H and hit tab. And then every time you see it stop, that's me hitting tab for getting more autocomplete suggestions. This kind of makes it faster to type and uh, you can avoid spelling errors. So we run it and bam, we got all the things we expected. So we created a hyperdrive with this particular key. I usually just look at the first four or last four bytes to make sure. Then we loaded the drive on another peer. When we tried to read the directory right away, um, we got an error because we hadn't synchronized with any peers yet. Um, as well, oh, I'm getting a call from Idaho. That is spam. <laughs> um, uh, and then once we waited for a peer to connect, we got their remote public key. And the next time we tried to read, we were able to get the contents of the file. Finally, when we tried to write to the file, there is an error. Yeah, so in the comment, in the chat, there was everything works, but I do get a console log message after everything. The feed is not writable. Did you create it? And that's the point part where we were trying to write to a feed which was not writable because we copied it from the first instance of the SDK to the second instance. And so the second instance was uh, read-only. Um, any questions so far? So there's a question, is there a way to open a hyperdrive as read-only in the OS, in the opts? Um, I think so. I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. Uh, I think there's the checkout API where it's definitely read-only there. Um, I don't know if there's a read-only flag in the constructor. I double check the hyperdrive docs on GitHub for that, um, probably. Cool. So next we're going to check out one of the cool, one of my favorite parts of Hyperdrive and that's the mutability. So um, we've had peer-to-peer -peer for a while. 
like BitTorrent has been a thing for, you know, as long as I can remember, you know, weeks at least. Um, and BitTorrent is cool because it lets us, lets us take files, put it into this thing, get a magnet link, and then download it from the peer-to-peer -peer network on the magnet link. But the one caveat is it's immutable. And there's a similar story with IPFS. Um, they, do have a they do have mutability stuff on top, but by default, um, if you have a URL, you can read it, but there's no changes that will come your way. So Hyperdrive provides an API for um, kind of detecting changes inside a drive when you uh, copy it. So again, we're gonna set up two instances of the SDK. We're gonna create an original Hyperdrive, add a file to it, make a copy, uh, do the whole dance, um, waiting for peers to open. And now what we're gonna do is use the hyperdrive.watch function. So watch lets you watch for changes. Whoa. <laughs> um, and what you can do is pass in a file path to kind of limit what, sh what you want to see changes in. So if you only wanna see changes in the posts directory, you can do slash posts and it'll filter out everything else. Um, in case you wanna have say like a pipeline where you want to react to changes and specific things and like trigger workflows or, you know, world's your oyster. So we're going to watch, pass a callback, which will get invoked every time there's a change. And we're going to get back this watcher, which we'll need for later. So in our code, uh, we're just going to write a file, wait a second, write a file and wait another second. And what should be happening is as files are being written to the original, the copy should be getting an update event and logging to the console. Finally, what we're gonna do is take that watcher object res results and destroy it, and then it'll stop watching for changes. And then we're gonna try to write again and show that there are gonna be no changes logged to the console. So th this is how you can kind of like, um, cancel watching because uh, again you don't want to have um, memory leaks and random stuff watching when it shouldn't anymore. Um, cool. So let's run that again. Um, so we're writing, we're getting the change detected event, and we're stopping the watcher and then we didn't get a change detected event after we wrote. Exciting. Um, questions? Will the watcher stay open on error? Um, in this case, yes. I made a boo boo and I didn't make sure that the watcher was being garbage collected inside finally. So great uh, find. You see, this person needs to do code reviews. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is just an example of how you got to be really careful <laughs> with error handling and not just whip stuff together for a workshop. <laughs> um, so we just did the watch for changes thing. And now we're going to look at a feature of the DAT SDK, which isn't necessarily used in all um, projects that build on Hypercore protocol, and that's the DNS resolution. So DNS resolution is a little bit up in the air right now, um, figuring out if we can do something more fancy for Beaker and get it merged into other places. But what the old version of the DAT CLI did and the old version of all the DAT stuff did was um, we had two methods of resolving a DNS name to a key that we can put into hyperdrive or hypercore. And that was one using special DNS TXT records, which basically said, hey, if you want this domain, here's a dat URL, which you can use to load um, for this domain. And so what would happen is when we pass in a domain name, we could query the DNS server, see if the record exists. And if it exists, we can resolve it to the key. The other method, which is a little bit hackier and a little bit easier to set up than mess. Yes, web server, 
um, at that domain. And then we ask it if it has a folder called well-known slash dat. And then that should return, uh, again, a DNS record with the dat key. And if that exists, then we'll resolve to that dat key. Um, so this kind of makes it easy if you're already proxying your hyperdrive on a web proxy, say with something like dat store, cough, cough, self-insert, um, or you know some sort of other daemon if they exist. And you can just kind of um, have the web server up and use it for DNS resolution without having to do DNS twice. So let's take a look at how that works. Um, we're going to import the resolve name API from the SDK. And we're going to be resolving my blog, because I think that's one of the few hyperdrives right now that actually use this feature. Um, and so we're going to pass my domain name, blog.mov.moe, to uh, the resolve name API. What we're going to get back from that is a key, which we can shove into hyperdrive. Um, we could do some code for, uh, you know, listening for peers and all that. I'm going to be lazy and I'm just going to sleep for three, um, 3,000 seconds, or sorry, 3,000 milliseconds or three seconds, because that's usually good enough for replication for um, robust code, you'll want to do the peer thing. And then we're going to try to read the index HTML from my website and then close it. So again, we're going to run that with node. How am I on time, by the way? Oh. You have Ignore another 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Excellent. Um, we probably won't get through the whole workshop, so I encourage you to check it out. There's comments, and it kind of guides you through the README, but we'll try to cover at least uh, the basics. So here we resolved blog.mov.moe to my hyperdrive key, and then we read the index.html, and then I have no clue what this is. Honestly, this scares me. It's some sort of Node.js bug by the looks of it. I'm going to pretend it's not there. And if you see it, also pretend it's not there for now. Because, um, you know, I don't see it. Cool. So that's pretty much all you need to know for Hyperdrive for now. There's some more stuff around uh, mount and version, but that's kind of a more advanced use case. And uh, just with these pieces, you should be um, getting enough. Uh, to get started. Ah, so people in the in the chat didn't get that fatal error, so that's good to hear. Um, so there's a question in chat. If you persist hyperdrives, where do they get stored? So we're using a module called env paths. Uh, uh, is there a readme? Yes. So uh, essentially, operating systems have different ways of storing user and application data. So a lot of Node.js projects and not Node.js projects are kind of lazy, and they just put a folder in your uh, home directory that's like dots, whatever the project name is, and then shove stuff in there. But there's um, specific places where that data is supposed to be stored for cache data, for configuration data and for data data. So we're using this module called ENV paths. And this will choose the specific storage for your operating system. You're going to want to kind of look to see uh, where in your operating system it is. And what this does is, is it takes an application name, which you can specify in the SDK constructor. But uh, by default, I think it's just um, that dash SDK. Actually, I'm, let's just check the readme. So, um, so uh, application, ah, application name. So optional name for the application using the SDK, automatically silo your data from other applications, blah, 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 uses this thing. Um, the default isn't documented. Uh, good first issue. But I think it's that dash SDK. And it should be somewhere in your OS specific folders. I think in um, on Linux, it's dot local. On 
uh, Windows, it's like application data or app data, and it's got like weird symbols in the name, I think. Um, Mac, I think it's library, and that's localized. Like I think in French, it's biblio bibliothèque or something, but there's docs in there. Uh, any other hyperdrive questions before I move on? All right, excellent, thank you. Uh, so next we're gonna be looking at Hypercore. So we just looked at Hyperdrive, super fancy, but Hyperdrive is actually the It seems pretty central to the whole protocol thing. Um, so what Hypercore is, is uh, it's kind of like a blockchain, but local first, um, or in, or as the nerds call it, an append-only log. So similar to a blockchain, a history going from the first block, and you can verify that each piece in the history was supposed to be in that um, chain. And so when you're downloading data from other peers, you can verify that it is valid data. And um, the other thing is the append-only log is immutable in that, uh, sorry, the, the append-only log is append-only in that you can only mutate it, you can only update it by appending to the end. So uh, it's kind of like a list starting at zero and you can always grow the list or um, a stack or a vector or whatever you want to call it. Basically, it always grows and you can't change the middle. Um, so this is actually the building block for all of the other um, data structures inside the DAT ecosystem. So Capricore uses Hypercore directly. Hyperdrive builds on top of Hypercore and it has several ones. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's other use cases I'm missing. So similar to Hyperdrive, uh, we're going to look at uh, how you create a core. So similar to Hyperdrive again, we're going to get the DAT SDK. The comments are a little bit more sparse in the later things because I kind of assumed you'd go through the first one and read those comments. Um, same as Hyperdrive, you can pass in either a name or a key or hyper URL. Uh, we used example again, and you can get the key out the exact same way you can create a hyper URL from it if you want. It won't load in Beaker. Um, and so in the read file and write file APIs, you have these append APIs. So in append, I can specify uh, whatever chunk I want to be the next block in the chain um, or the next chunk in the core. Uh, whatever you want to call it. So this is how you can add data to your hypercore. Every time you add stuff to your hypercore, its length increases. So core.length is a property that tells you how much history exists in this hypercore at the moment, so that you have an upper limit for where you can download data. And of course, the lower limit is zero. So um, Hypercore is zero indexed. That means the first chunk you add is going to be at zero, and you can get it with the get API. If I add three more chunks, the third chunk is going to be at three, because that would be four chunks total. Math. Um, and so similarly, when you read data from a hyperdrive, by default, it gives you just a raw buffer. But what you can do is in the um, get method, you can pass this value encoding parameter. And similar to um, in Hyperdrive, it can be either binary, UTF-8, or some other advanced features if you're interested in learning that. And that's basically all there is um, that we're going to go over for now. So let's run that. Uh, so we created a hypercore, we got a unique key, we appended to it, and now see that the length is one. We loaded a chunk as a binary buffer, and then we loaded it as the text, hello world. Great. 
Um, any questions so far about Hypercore? Excellent. So next similar, oh, I messed up. This is why you don't copy paste. It should be load a core. <laughs> Hopefully you weren't relying on those. Um, so again, we're gonna do pretty much the same thing we did for hyperdrive. So we're going to uh, create two instances of the SDK, but this time two instances of hypercore. We're gonna create an original hypercore add some data to it, um, get the key, and create a copy. We're going to wait for the copy to be ready. And then, um, in this case, it seems, uh, oh yeah, and so we try to get the data again before we have any peers. It's going to error out. And then we're going to do the thing where we wait for the peer open events. So uh, what's useful is that Hypercore and Hyperdrive have very similar APIs for events and um, extensions and stuff, which we'll get into. So um, what's nice is that a lot of code that could do um, hypercore things can also do hyperdrive things and vice versa. So you don't have to learn too many new concepts when switching between the two. So similar to what we did when we had our local core, we can get a value from this copy and then log it to the console. Um, any questions about that? So while they're typing, I'm just going to run it. And it did pretty much exactly what you would have ex expected. It created a hypercore, loaded the core on the other peer. It's not writable. It, oh, apparently this time it already connected before it got to um, uh, it got to having to wait for peers. And then it read the remote contents. And then what's here, uh, it tried to write, but it had an error. So there's a question in the chat, what do you prefer for which use case, core versus drive? So that's kind of difficult. Um, because they're kind of different, but then you can kind of do both and both. Um, so typically what I like to use hypercore for is stuff where I don't need data to be um, sparsely indexed. So I'm probably gonna be parsing through all of the data or I'm probably gonna be iterating through the data from the front or the back. Um, and that's useful for stuff like chat messages or um, sensor data. Uh, basically, wherever you have a log of events, that can be handy. I like Hyperdrive, obviously, for files. I probably wouldn't use Hypercore for storing files. And I actually like representing data as files. So having like a log of all of my blog posts as the raw markdown. Um, yeah, so I I guess that's kind of the main thing. Generally, you can use Hyperdrive for most things you'd use Hypercore for, um, but it's kind of up to you to play around with either. Um, one thing to note is at the moment, uh, all the web browsers that do Hyper or Hypercore protocol stuff only support um, the Hyperdrive API. So you probably won't be able to use Hypercore yet. That might change in the near future, but if you're talking about like right today, um, you're probably only going to get the um, hypercore stuff if you're using Node.js or Electron, or if you're using the SDK in a browser rather than built-in stuff in, uh, say, Beaker or Gateway or Egregore or whatever else, or uh, that web extension or um, Bunsen browser. I'll back. <laughs> Uh, another question, is an index maintained behind the scenes of the start of each chunk of the hypercore? Um, so the way that index works, uh, Jim Pick actually had a great explanation of how the on-disk uh, on data structure for hypercore is uh, represented. But uh, basically there's this like Merkle tree being created under the hood and then you can find 
all of the raw data is stored in just like a flat uh, file. And then the Merkle tree kind of lets you figure out which indexes in the file correspond to which indexes in the chunk. So I'd rec recommend going uh, into the YouTube playlist and looking at Jim Pick's uh, talk because that kind of tells you more stuff. Um, Cool. So um, we just loaded a hypercore. Uh, and then was there anything else? That was it for hypercore. Great. So now we have the data structures that make up the DAT ecosystem, pretty much. Um, the only other things are stuff that build on top. So hypertry, which I don't have an example of here, but it's the thing that makes the kind of file system uh, or directory structure in hyperdrive and it's useful just as a key value store with um, directories um, and then there's other things like kappa which basically take hypercore data and then go through it and generate indexes inside a separate database usually level db so those are kind of things higher level and you can probably mix and match them with the sdk in your applications but they're not really part of the core because um, they don't need to be. You can just do your own stuff. Um, so the last piece is about actually leveraging the peer-to-peer -peer networking side. So we're, we've got these hyperdrives and hypercores. We have this peer-to-peer -peer swarm that's connecting us to each other. But, um, you know, sometimes you want to exchange data with folks, which isn't loading their hyperdrive and reading from it. Sometimes we want like duplex connections and sometimes we want to send data that's not going to be persisted forever in a distributed network. So for that, we have extension messages. So the way Hypercore protocol works is it is a message based protocol. When I connect to a peer, we send each other uh, individual messages and those messages either contain data about wanting to get some data from them or sending some data to them or some metadata or handshaking. So they're individual little chunks of messages that help the peers coordinate with each other. Um, a cool feature is that you can actually define your own custom messages using uh, extensions. So what you can do is define a new message type which takes a string and you can, if both sides of the connection are both using that message type, they can send each other chunks of data for that message type and react to it. Um, so let's check out what that looks like. Um, so um, we're gonna do pretty much the same thing as before, except now we're gonna be um, loading up the hypercore API, the hyperdrive API, and this new register extension API. Ooh. And we're going to be creating two instances of the SDK again. So let's take a look at what an extension looks like. So typically, uh, what we can do is have instance and then give back some event listeners and some data about encoding. So here we have a function, it returns a JavaScript object, and it has three properties. Encoding is similar to the value encoding property or the encoding property uh, that we saw earlier in um, Hypercore and Hyperdrive respectively. And this kind of automatically converts between binary buffers and some other um, formats. So there's a few built-in types, uh, UTF-8 binary and my favorite JSON. Uh, Hypercore supports these as well. And what's cool is um, over the wire, it's always going to be binary buffers, but in your ap application, you can now parse it out as something else. Um, you can also do more advanced encodings, like passing in a protocol buffer implementation, which we're not going to go into today, but you can probably Google it. Um, next, you have an on message handler, which is a function which will be invoked for every message that you receive from a peer. And what you can do in this message handler is get the actual event, um, pick out some data from it, if it's a JSON object or otherwise. And then you also get a reference to the peer and you can use that extension object from earlier to send a response to that peer. So for instance, here, every time 
we get uh, the message hello, we're going to respond to that peer with an object saying message world. Uh, and so to do that, you do extension.send your message and then the peer that you want to send the message to. Uh, then lastly, there's an on error handler, and that's only really invoked if you have errors while um, doing the encoding and decoding of the messages. So if two sides have different encodings, um, they'll error out, and then you can handle the errors here. Usually you'll probably just ignore them, but um, it's there. Um, cool. So what we're going to do next is set up the same um, kind of situation where we have some uh, hypercores and hyperdrives on the first instance of the swarm. So we set up a hypercore, set up a hyperdrive, and then we're going to use the register extension API for registering the extension handler. So um, as you noted earlier, there's the top level register extension API in the SDK. And what this does is it uh, establishes extension messages on every single connection at the top level. So every time you connect to any peer, you can start extending, ex exchanging extensions on this um, message type, regardless of what hypercores or hyperdrives you're actually replicating. Um, I think some people in the ecosystem use this for uh, authentication. Um, you might use it for some other fancy things, like maybe automatic discovery of hypercores on the other side. Um, you know, whatever you want. It's wild, wild west. And you can also use the same register extension API on a hypercore or a hyperdrive. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Um, are these extension messages stored in the core or drive? And no, they're not. So uh, they're not stored anywhere. They're literally just sent over the wire. So whenever I use extension.send, I take that data, I send it over the wire to the other end, and then you receive it in your on message handler, and then it's gone. So they're kind of ephemeral. And they're there just for like sending short little messages, mostly for coordinating or pretty much whatever else. Um, in the old version of Beaker, I actually had an experiment where I used this extension messages API to um, send position data for a multiplayer VR game. So um, you can have a bunch of people load a web VR scene in a beaker, and then whenever they move around, they send their position data over the extension messages, and then the other peers can update their represent representation of the avatar on their side, um, which is pretty cool. But you can use this for you know, multiplayer data for just real-time notifications. I think there's a library, uh, YJS, which uses it for navig uh, negotiating its own protocol for replicating peer-to-peer uh, -peer data, structure, data structures. They have a conflict-free replicated data type, and they have the, their own protocol for actually replicating it. And instead of messing around with hyperdrives or hypercores, they just do it right on top of the connections directly. Um, question in the chat, did you get that VR demo working again? No, I didn't. It is for the old version of Beaker and those API just changed and I'm kind of doing a million things at, at once, but hopefully I'll be able to get it working again once I figure out the um, extension message stuff for Agrigor, maybe, because that, that'd be cool. Um, shameless self-insert. Um, what I really like using extension messages for is messaging for secure channels. So what's cool is if you register an extension on a hypercore, the only people that you'll get messages from is people that have that hypercore key. So you can use it as kind of like a private pub sub channel. So um, you kind of initialize connections for the hypercore, and then instead of using the hypercore, you use it just for the connections and exchange data with each other. Um, and that's super handy for uh, discovering data that's supposed to be private to people um, that only know a given key. And I th think if, I, if I'm correct, that's how um, Cabal, for instance, discovers peers. You have the Cabal key, which is used for discovering peers. And then you know that only people that have that Cabal key 
uh, we'll be able to exchange extension messages so you can send them all of the hypercores that you know. Are extension messages uh, encrypted over the network? Yes, they're encrypted at the transport level. Um, so they're not going to be man in the middle. So you can send sensitive information as long as you're okay with anyone that has that, um, that knows that hypercore key uh, or anyone you're replicating with if we're talking about the top level replication level extension messages. As long as you're comfortable with trusting those people, then you're safe to send whatever data you want. Um, yeah, one caveat is uh, just because you're sending an extension, you're only sending it to the people you're directly connected to. So usually in a mesh, you might have like a bunch of peers, but they're not fully connected. So even though peer A is connected to peer B, it's not connected to peer C, even though C is connected to B. So for that, you're going to want to use some sort of library that does kind of broadcasting that does multiple hops within the network. And that's actually going to be the next um, demo, which we'll get into. So Hyperdrive, same thing as Hypercore. Uh, you just invoke register extension. You pass uh, a string for the extension name and the handler. So finally, uh, another cool thing with extensions is you can broadcast an extension to everyone that you're currently connected to. So um, that uses the aptly named broadcast method. So if I take an extension instance, I can broadcast to all of the peers that I'm connected to that are using that extension with me. So when over here, whenever we receive a peer on either the hypercore or the hyperdrive, we're going to send a broadcast to all of the peers we're connected to. Um, so then here, we're just loading up the copy hypercore and ho copy hyperdrive, waiting for them to be ready. And what we're going to do is also register the extension messages on them, but this time we're not going to be worrying about broadcasting. So what should happen here is the first hypercore and hyperdrive get initialized the second one get initialized, peer-to-peer -peer connections are established between the two instances of, um, of uh, the SDK, and then we receive the peer add event on one end, it broadcasts an event to the other side, and then that side responds. Whew. Okay, let's see that in action. So we run it, and it happens super fast because uh, there's no uh, disk IO or anything, it's literally just um, connecting and sending data right away. So here we got the message hello, uh, what is that, six times? Something like that, five times? Yeah, five times. And that was um, the first instance of the SDK sending it to the second one, so it received hello. Then we got the same number of responses saying world back. And you can see here, it was from each of the types of extension messages. So protocol, core, um, and drive. Yeah. OK, questions about extension messages. This is kind of like a more advanced realm. Is there a list of some community curated extensions? Not that I know of. Um, I'd be more than happy to help facilitate uh, like creating a list. I think so far I've published um, like three modules that use extensions. And I think Substack has published a few modules that use extensions. Some of the um, Kappa core things might have been um, abstracted out, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so right now there's like a bunch of things. It'd be nice if we could have some initiative to just like bring them all together in a readme somewhere, even in the SDK. I think like it'd be nice to have a useful module section in the SDK so that people can get started with it. Uh, so question from Eric, where does gRPC fit into the ecosystem? At the moment, it actually doesn't fit in anywhere. Um, so gRPC is Google's remote procedure call API. And what it was being used for is uh, there's a project called Hyperdrive Daemon, which is like a server that holds all of your hypercore protocols. 
a process to talk to that server and all of the actual peer-to-peer -peer stuff is done on there and then your process um, doesn't have any of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff but then that also means that you can have a bunch of processes talking to it and the peer-to-peer -peer stuff is all just done in one process so it was kind of like a way to bring a bunch of things together and so that interface was using uh, grpc for communication but as an earlier talk um, i think matthias presented i think where was that andrew and paul i don't know one of them presented that they actually migrated away from grpc to this new thing which is hrpc which is basically the same thing, but slightly different and used for basically the same thing, but slightly different. But um, that SDK doesn't currently touch that at all. Um, you could hypothetically use it with the, um, the new hyperspace module because it provides a core store API, which is kind of like the thing that the SDK uses for managing all of the hyper cores under the hood. So you could, create a core store in um, hyperspace, which uses this HRPC thing, and then pass that core store to the SDK, and then have the SDK use that indirectly. But um, it's currently not in the SDK. Um, and it doesn't really need to be because you can do it outside of it. Um, how am I on time? I'm gonna start on the next part. I think I have like, what, another 10 minutes, something? 20? I don't know. What is time in coronavirus times? There's only two times, which is like pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. <laughs> okay, cool. So now that we saw how extension messages work, let's check out how um, to use existing extension message libraries. So I've got one that I really like to use um, called Hyperflood. And what that means is you can send messages that are guaranteed to get to every single peer in the network, even if you're not uh, directly connected to them. And this is using a thing called uh, flooding. Um, big thanks to uh, Martin from the Geot team for helping me figure this module out. They did something pretty similar for, their, um, for one of their modules. So it's cool stuff. So similar to before, we're going to initialize uh, the two SDKs, but this time we're going to be using an additional property called key pair. So I mentioned back in the, um, uh, I think, hypercore or hyperdrive docs, that remote public key thing. So you can actually get your own public key by using this key pair object. So key pair dot public key is the public key that you're using for replication. And that could be useful in applications where you want to know what your identity is so that you can tell others so that they can trust you or distrust you or whatever else you want to do. Um, right. And so hyperflood makes use of that key pair because you need to know your identity to tell uh, to know when you receive a packet from yourself so that you can ignore it. Um, though, actually, that might not be necessary. Anyways, it's useful other places. So what we actually did here was set up three... Um, 10 minutes. Okay, okay. Speed mode. Um, we're basically done. Um, I'm not going go to go into the... We can do longer if people are okay with it. Um, are people okay with it? You could try make a poll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try uh, to make definitely a Definitely happy. Um, you could, uh, you know, uh, yes. Yes or no, are you okay with it? Oh. Okay, so... Seems like a lot of folks are into it. Um, so we could we can do the extra special sauce that I wasn't sure if we'd had have time to, for, which is kind of putting all of this together in an application that works in both Node.js and in Electron. I was gonna also do web, but that was like way more moving parts. So we're just gonna do Electron and Node for now which should cover a lot of your use cases because that's like 
the true peer-to-peer -peer environments. So what we're doing here is actually kind of intense. We're using some parameters that I didn't mention before called advertise and lookup. So the way the peer-to-peer -peer network works is you have this thing called Hyperswarm. And what you can do is tell Hyperswarm if someone wants to connect to this key, so this hyperdrive key or this hypercore key, um, tell them my IP address. And that's called um, advertising. So you advertise to the network being like, hey, you can connect to me if you want this. And then lookup is the opposite. I want to find other peers that have this, um, uh, that have this key. So I'm going to ask Hyperswarm, hey, whose IP addresses have this key? And then I'm going to connect to them. So um, by default, uh, all hypercores and hyperdrives in the SDK do both an announce and a lookup because that's the best for discovering lots and lots of peers. Um, but uh, you can turn that on and off if you want to like only passively look up peers without um, telling you're around on the hyperswarm for whatever reason. We can exploit that to create a scenario where there's peers that can't connect to each other. So if two peers them as advertising, then they won't find each other because they're both going to look on Hyperswarm and be like, oh, hey, who else has this key? And Hyperswarm is going to be like, no one has this key because no one's advertised. So we're going to exploit this to have two peers that don't advertise and one peer that does. So what that should do is create a connection where we have peer A connected to peer B connected to peer C, but peer A and C aren't connected to each other directly. Um, this can happen in the network sometimes, even if both peers do advertise and look up, but um, I needed to simulate it to make this make sense. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're just setting up three hypercores um, all for the same key, and we're making sure that they each only have, um, uh, they, it's not a fully connected graph. So next, what we're going to do is initialize the hyperfloods API. Uh, so we're going to pass in our, that shouldn't be key, that should be public key. How is this working? <laughs> I guess it's working. Anyways, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're passing in um, the public key into hyperflood, and then we're going to register the extension on uh, our hypercore. So again, what registering on the hypercore means is only peers that are replicating that hypercore will be sending these extension messages. Um, so next, what we're going to do is listen on um, messages in one of the peers, and we're going to log any messages we get to the console. And then we're going to wait for a few seconds, um, just so that everything connects. Um, and this isn't the best way to do it. You probably want to actually listen on peer out events if you care. But we'll simulate um, this is like asynchronous connections happening. And at some point in the future, after they've connected, someone is broadcasting out an event. So with Hyperflood, similar to the broadcast in regular extensions, you can broadcast um, to the flood. And what should happen is this will go out to from a peer two to peer uh, one, and then to peer three. And so peer three will log to the console. So again, we're going to go and run this example. So we registered the ex extensions. We're waiting a little bit. We sent out the message to the swarm, and it got flooded to that peer. Um, wow. So uh, this isn't a big deal for small swarms. But if you have like hundreds and hundreds of peers in a swarm and you want to make sure that all of them receives an event, uh, this flood thing kind of makes that happen in the not most efficient way, but it's like better than not efficient at all. Uh, where did I change to public key? Uh, I don't think you actually need to change it because um, it's just going to process its own message and log it because it'll think that it's getting a message from someone else, but it's actually getting a message from itself. It's kind of inconsequential, 
but what we're doing is we're changing the ID to be our public key instead of key pair dot e, which is undefined. Um, I think you can find the docs for key pair in the dat SDK readme if you want to read more. Um, cool. So comment in the chat. So this can make one of the peers like a game server mediating the interaction between anonymous peers. Kind of, you could set up a scenario where you have only one peer advertising and everyone else only doing lookups. And then in that scenario, they would only connect to that one peer. Um, it's not a really good guarantee because anyone can just pretend, uh, anyone can just like set themselves to advertise and then that'd mess up your whole setup. Um, if you wanna make sure that you're only sending particular messages to a particular peer, what you're gonna wanna do is use that uh, remote public key feature and make sure to only send it to peers with that remote public key. Alternately, you might want some sort of encryption key where you encrypt your messages, flood them to the whole network, but only the recipient can decrypt those messages. And so for that, you might want to build on top of the uh, secret box module, which does encryption for groups of peers. Okay, cool. So that's kind of everything. Um, are we still down to see the last bits in the last 10 minutes here? So what we're going to do is we're going to put this all together in a chat application because you know, I love chat applications and chat applications are the hello world of um, peer to peer and real time stuff. Similar to how the hello world of um, JavaScript frameworks is to do MVC. Um, we're going to do chat. Cool. So um, what we're going to do is do a chat app. The idea is that every peer in the network is going to have their own hypercore. And whenever they post a message, they're going to append it to their hypercore. They're also going to have another hypercore, which has a key that is shared between every single other peer. And they're going to be using extension messages to tell each other about each other's hypercore keys. So basically, we connect to somebody, we tell them, hey, here's my hypercore. You should start reading from it to see my messages. Oh, by the way, here's all of the other hypercores I've ever seen. You should probably start re uh, reading messages from them as well. And then um, they're going to tell you all of the things they've ever seen. And at the end of the day, everyone's going to know everyone else's hypercores and you're all going to be swarming with each other. And hopefully this will actually like work over the internet with everyone else. Um, you know, pinkies, fingers crossed. Uh, but let's look at how we can structure it. So one thing that I mentioned is important or is important to me is code reuse across environments. So the whole point of that SDK is that you shouldn't care about whether it's a Node.js app or a Electron app or a web app or hopefully in the near future a React Native app or a React or a Node.js mobile app or whatever else. We should just have some core peer-to-peer -peer logic, which is pretty high level, and then we don't have to care about um, where what the underlying details are actually doing. We just want it to work and we focus on our data in our application and what messages we're sending to each other. So with that in mind, um, I like to usually build some sort of core and I see it a lot in the ecosystem where you kind of define the core data model or interaction model of your application and then you reuse that with different user interfaces. So Cabal does that with Cabal Core. And I think their key gossip thing is pretty much the same as what I described, just probably a bit fancier. So um, I like to export an async function for when I have some sort of async initialization code. So you pass in whatever configura uh, configuration options you want, and then you return the fully configured option, that, uh, object that you can actually um, invoke methods on. I use classes um, very sparingly, basically just for this use case to like extend event emitter and have a few methods together. Uh, generally speaking, I'm not a big fan of like huge taxonomies of classes and like, you know, 
Java. Let's not do that. Um, one thing I forgot to mention here is the hard-coded key. It's 64 characters long, so it's a valid hypercore uh, key, um, but it's just junk data I made up. In this case, it says bad because that's not secure at all, and you probably want to like generate them on the fly and have them user configurable. It'll work for our use case. So our um, example app core is going to take an instance of the dat SDK. We're just going to take the hypercore uh, constructor from it because that's all we really need for this app. I'm going to set up some internal variables, yada, yada. So here, we're going to initialize our hypercore for our messages. So we're going to pass in a name, my messages. So again, even though we're using my messages on every instance of the SDK, every person is going to generate their own hypercore. Um, and the name is just there as like a shorthand to make it easier to reference to things. Um, we're going to do a fancy little trick, which is passing a value encoding in the construction, in the constructor. What this lets us do is every time we add data or get data, sorry, append or get data from the hypercore, it's going to be automatically encoded into JSON so that we don't have to worry about stringifying and parsing it manually or um, so we can just have objects in our JavaScript and not worry about it. Um, next, we're going to initialize the hypercore we're using purely for discovery, and we're going to register an extension where every time we receive a message from someone, we're going to invoke this handler and do some, something about the message. As well, every time we receive a message on the discovery core, we're going to do something with the peer. And then next, we're going to watch for changes in our own core so that we can notify the application to start rendering our own messages. Um, watch core, uh, what we're going to do is have some boilerplate um, to make sure we don't watch the same core twice and have duplicate messages. And then we're going to tell the UI, hey, here's this new core that we found. You can render either like a user list or whatever other fancy UI you want. And then uh, we're going to have this loop, which I'm just going to dub the update head loop. Um, so we're going to invoke core.update. And what that does is it says, hey, hypercore, whenever you have new data, um, invoke this callback. So our callback is going to be invoked when the peer adds some new data to their hypercore. We're going to get the head, which is the latest uh, item in the hypercore. We're going to get the data out of it, and we're going to emit it to the application. And then we're going to wait for the next update and loop again and again and again. Um, finally, we're going to have a method for writing a message to our hypercore, um, which is just going to take a string or buffer or whatever JSON type, and then append it to our writable hypercore. Finally, whenever we receive an extension mes that message, we're going to get all of the keys that the other person knows. And we're going to see if there's any keys that we don't know about. If we already know about all these keys, we don't care, whatever. Like, I'm so over that. Um, but if we don't know these keys, we're going to initialize the hypercore for each uh, key. And then we're going to watch it for changes. And then finally, if we did have new keys, we should probably tell everyone we know about it so that they will, uh, so that the keys will propagate through the network. This doesn't matter when it's one on one so much, but this is important for when you have a lot of um, peers and you have a sparsely connected graph. Finally, whenever we receive a new peer, we're just going to send it all of the keys that we know so far. Okay, questions so far? Cool. So finally, we have the core of our data model. Let's actually glue it to a person. And easiest way is to hack together a totally janky command line interface. Um, so just like in the examples before, I have this async main. It's going to set up first the SDK and then set up that core API I mentioned. We're going to set up our um, text interface so that whenever we have a message coming in from the core, we're going to log it to the console. And every time um, we get a new 
here, we're going to log it to the console. And then every time you type a line into your command line, we're going to write it as a message. So I invite everyone to go to their terminal and run the CLI app. So hopefully um, we'll see some other connections, though potentially we won't. Um, oh, new peer. Hi there. Yeet. Exciting. We're getting like a ton of new peers. Hello, friends. Um, row, row, fight the power. Excellent. So, oh my god, it works. So now, um, feel free to chat there. Please don't say rude stuff. <laughs> um, my mom might see this. Uh, <laughs> anyways, so now we have a command line interface. Super easy. But, um, you know, we want super fancy, like, 2020 level graphics. So for that, we're going to be using Electron. So there's two ways you can use Electron with um, the SDK, uh, because Electron has two processes. Or there's actually three ways, but we're not going to talk about the third one. There's the main process in Electron, which is basically just Node.js. And then there's the remote require API in Electron, which uh, is in the render process. So in the actual web page, you can tell it, hey, load some code that's in the Node.js side, but let me pretend like it's in my side. And you want to do that because if you try to require the code just on the browser side, it won't has a have access to all of the, um, it might not have access to all of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer APIs. I actually haven't tested it. It might work. But that is in, um, app slash electron.html. So just like before, um, I have some CSS and some HTML just for setting up the structure. doesn't matter too much. Uh, we're going to require the Electron API. We're going to get the SDK and the core API. We're going to set up some, um, we're going to get our HTML elements, like the good old days before React. And then pretty much the same as the CLI. We're going to listen on messages, but this time we're going to log it to our text output and we're going to listen on new pe peers. And then whenever you submit the form, we're going to write it to the core, which will propagate to everybody else. Um, so I zoomed past that, but to run it, you're going to want to look in the package.json. There's a script here called run example app. So if you do npm run, run example app. It'll start up a um, electron app. So I'm just going to stop sharing and switch to my uh, electron page. So hey, it's pretty much exactly the same code, except now uh, it's in a graphical interface. And so you can make this fancier. Um, you can probably extend this into your own chat app or whatever else, or like pretty much everything is just either like a chat app or a to-do list. And a chat app is just a special type of to-do list. Um, so with this, we basically got QED for um, making peer-to-peer -peer apps with DAT. So um, I guess maybe like three minutes of questions, and then I'll let people go to sleep and let the poor organizers rest. <laughs> um, so feel free to even just like unmute yourself and ask questions right away if you have. Um... We are not poor. We are happy to be here. <laughs> OK, fine. Uh, the happy to be here suffering organizers <laughs> at like 6 AM in Japan. <laughs> Um, so there's a question from P. Mario, who is using the SDK at the moment. Um, honestly, me, me and me, but with different projects. So Dat Dot presented earlier, and um, we worked together to use the SDK for doing the Dat side of Dat Dot for loading um, cores and for um, doing some off-chain communication with Hyperswarm. Um, in the Natakanu app, uh, 
which is an app I was working on for Wapikoni Mobile and Concordia University in Montreal, um, which is file transfer for Indigenous groups in Canada. Um, I'm using it in Agrigore, which is my peer-to-peer -peer web browser. Um, I use it basically anytime I want to mess around with that stuff because honestly setting up all of the networking and storage stuff is a pain in the butt. Um, it seems in the chat Duncan is using um, uh, it, which is really cool. Thank you, D Duncan. We should probably have like a who's using it section in the README. Um, there's a question in the chat, can a quantum computer find your 64-byte hex key? Um, so that's your secret key, random number generator. I don't know how weak um, ellip elliptic curves are to Shor's algorithm. Um, I just Googled that, like, can Shor's algorithm be used for elliptic keys? Uh, and then that'll tell you. I'm not a computer scientist. Um, Martin says, is there a way to see what that SDK SDK does differently from hyperdrives. Um, not really. The main difference is really just the constructor is different. Um, I have some additional options for persisting data and for the networking, which you can see in the documentation in the README. Um, and then the other thing is that you can't configure the storage as a parameter. So regular hyperdrive takes two parameters. It takes a key or null, and uh, that key has to be either um, hexadecimal string that's 64 characters long or a buffer with 32 bytes or null. That's the only valid values. And then the other option is the storage, which has to be an instance of random access storage, or it'll use the different file one, and then the configuration params. In that SDK, it takes a name, which can either be a key or a hyper URL, or a name for creating writable things. And it also has some extra, it doesn't have a storage option, and then it has some extra parameters in the um, config, which are not in the regular hyperdrive. Um, and hypercore is pretty much the same thing. Register extension just doesn't exist in hyperdrive. It comes from a different library called Core Store Swarm Networker. Um, and so that is a thing actually managing all of the connections and the connections to Hyperswarm, the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And so that is where the register extension top level thing comes from. Um, basically all of the other exported things from um, that SDK are kind of like just comment from Eric, I should be able to use these examples to build something now, hopefully. Um, if you're running into trouble, feel free to open an issue on GitHub uh, in that project slash SDK. Um, hopefully we'll fix it, but it's been pretty stable for me in my use cases. I think the place that needs most work is like web, because um, web is kind of tricky, um, but someone's using it. Uh, question from P Mario: how, how does the SDK work together with the daemon? It currently doesn't. Uh, you could use it with the new um, hyperspace thing by doing that core store trick that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, which you should scroll back and review in the video. But it doesn't use the daemon directly right now. It uses the raw JavaScript primitives. But it could if you pass in a custom core store in the constructor. Um, from Sarah Path, there's a Hyperland module list, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know if it's SDK related. Cool. Um, any other SDK or workshop questions, comments, concerns, uh, deep, dark fears or desires? Cool. Well, Thank you all so much for Hyper SDK. Okay, comment from um, Martin, Hyper SDK. I don't know if I'm going to rename it to Hyper SDK. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm just using Data SDK for now while we figure out all of the organizational stuff because um, I don't have the spoons for thinking about name changes. Um, oh, cool. It seems that. I probably wouldn't call it MOVE SDK. 
Um, I don't know. I'm also thinking of as Agrigor's fetch API gets more robust, I'm thinking of actually doing uh, using that more and more for projects because that'll be a little more uh, portable to between uh, web browsers and mobile web browsers and just like having this fetch interface, I think is really nice compared to all of these JavaScript APIs. But that SDK is still going to be maintained because that's going to be what is fueling that fetch and all of these other um, projects. Cool. Well, thank you all so much for um, sitting through all of this. Hopefully this has been useful. I'm going to be linking to this video in the SDK docs now, which is going to be great because I can just point people there and point people to the repo when they want to learn more. There is a little bit of details in the um, that workshop readme that I might have glossed over in the video and probably vice versa. Um, if you have more examples of stuff that you've been use, uh, that's been useful for you or different patterns that have been useful, I very much welcome submitting pull requests uh, that work. And uh, if you have some examples that you'd like to see, open an issue on the DAT workshop repo and hopefully we can just make this useful for people and also hopefully we can get it working in React Native somehow so that um, we can have one more environment for all of this stuff working. Ideally, like once it's in React Native, honestly, my life is just going to be 